cover of uh, First Fallen, the book that's uh, been my life's work so far. Um, I would like to uh, uh, preface this by saying I there's a picture of me out there in the um, internets, uh, and I don't look much like my picture anymore. I was diagnosed about a year ago with cancer, and uh, so um, it's not in remission or anything, uh, and I'll do my best. Uh, bear with me if I forget a name or give a wrong date. So those of you with uh, something to drink, um, uh, sit back and have another cup of it. And uh, let's talk about Elmer Ellsworth. Uh, everybody always asks me, uh, how come Elmer Ellsworth? And um, I taught at Brownell Middle School. And this man, who is not the Elmer Ellsworth I know you were expecting, um, is the namesake of uh, Brownell Middle School. And he is a uh, distant relative of uh, Francis Brownell, Frank Brownell, the man who killed the man who uh, shot Ellsworth. And yes, indeed, the EE -E in front of his name does stand for Elmer Ellsworth. I just thought the coincidence was amazing. But this is the man, Colonel Ellsworth was the first union officer killed in the Civil War. And that's about all most people know about Elmer Ellsworth. And um, I'm here to tell you a lot more. Um, he was always interested in military things from a, a little boy on up. And uh, unless you're in the actual military in the 1850s, 40s, there wasn't uh, a lot to do except be in a local militia. And local militias needed a serious upgrade at that point since uh, uh, the Revolutionary War. Usually they were just uh, brought out for uh, Fourth of July, um, George Washington's birthday, and an occasional funeral. And he ended up getting, as he got a little older, and I mean a little older, like 16, serial employment as a, as a militia drill master in Illinois and Wisconsin. And the first uh, group that made him famous was in his hometown of Chicago. He was born in upstate New York. Self-made man took himself to Chicago via New York City and uh, hooked up with uh, uh, an, another young man who uh, they started a, a patent business together and they were both members of the Chicago Zoo of Cadets, which had fallen on hard times. And um, uh, Alfred Devereaux, who went on to become a, um, the commander of the 22nd Massachusetts, and Elmer Ellsworth um, brought that group basically back up to snuff, taught them uh, the lightning drill of the Zouaves and uh, every drill competition that they entered, uh, they won. They also did Scott's and Hardy's drill, which is used by the army. And after they won all these awards in the Chicago area, Elmer issued a challenge to all the other militia drill teams um, to challenge his men as the best drill team in the world and none responded. So he decided to reinvent the Chicago Zoo of Cadets as the United States Zoo of Cadets. He decided to uh, rename them, reuniform them, and uh, he planned a tour of the Northeast that took place in 20 cities, including West Point and the presidential mansion of President Buchanan. The tour was what really put Elmer Ellsworth and his Zouabs on the map. They became famous all over the United States, but especially in the Northeast. Uh, they toured, um, I say, 20 cities. And at the end, hold on here. Hmm. Give me a moment. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, he uh, ended up meeting in Springfield, met uh, Abraham Lincoln, a young lawyer. And uh, Lincoln decided to take his uh, little boys down to the Springfield Fairgrounds to see the US Zoo of Cadets uh, practice their drill. It was the last meeting before they got home to Chicago. 
and he introduced himself and uh, was introduced to Elmer Ellsworth. Ellsworth always managed to know the movers and shakers of every um, big city that he went to for, for some, some reason. Um, and they introduced him to a lawyer and soon to be presidential candidate, Abraham Lincoln. And he's so impressed with Elmer Ellsworth that he gets Elmer to promise him to come back to Springfield to study law. Um, he found out actually that Elmer Ellsworth needed to become a lawyer if he wanted to marry um, his, the love of his life, young Miss Carey, um, who, whose uh, father lived in Rockford and was a, an influential banker. Um, Ellsworth had drilled the Rockford Grays, met her when she was 16. He was uh, just, just turned 20. Um, and uh, he sort of asked dad, you know, can I marry your daughter? And dad said, no, you don't make any money. You'd better become a lawyer. The way they became lawyers at that point in time was they found a lawyer who would take them on and they studied with them until they could pass the bar. And then they hung up their own shield. So uh, an invitation from as premier a lawyer as Lincoln was at the time was quite uh, a feather in Ellsworth's um, many feathered cap. Um, these are John Hay and George Nicolay, Ellsworth's best friends. When he returned to Springfield, which is the capital of Illinois, he meets John Hay and George Nicolay. Hay studying law with his uncle across the hall from Abraham Lincoln. Um, Hay has been given the same ultimatum by his father. Hay graduated poet laureate from uh, the Ivy League of Brown University, came back to uh, Chicago and his father said, what are you nuts? You're, you're a dope smoker and a long haired hippie poet. Go get a real job. So he um, decided to study with his uncle and get a law degree. And Nicolay had been publishing a German language newspaper that was very pro Lincoln. Lots of people think of Lincoln as a, a country lawyer, but um, Lincoln was although he practiced in the country and did a lot of country cases. He was also a corporate lawyer. He represented the railroad. Um, he did whatever came his way and he was quite well known. And uh, because he represented things like the railroad, uh, he quite often got into the newspapers. George Hay was a big supporter of his. I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, John Nicolay was a big supporter of his. Um, and uh, all three became good friends. Nicolay was chosen to write the official Lincoln biography and is named the first secretary for Abraham Lincoln's attempt at the presidency. And Hay gets a job as a second secretary. So here we have candidate Lincoln. And uh, Elmer joins the Lincoln campaign almost immediately, works with David Douglas and Ward Hill Lehman uh, at the convention in the wigwam. They delay the the vote for 24 hours through some uh, sort of finagling, I guess you would say, um, and ended up taking over the wigwam. Lincoln won on the third ballot. And to celebrate, uh, Elmer Ellsworth took a group up to the top of the Tremont Hotel and uh, almost fell off the roof when they were firing a, a victory cannon. So, um, Hay and uh, uh, Ellsworth take to the stump. Um, and sp speak all around the Springfield area uh, for Abraham Lincoln. The campaign headquarters was across from the Lincoln Herndon Law Office. And um, the day of voting in Illinois, they uh, go with Abraham Lincoln to vote. They all vote and then they go back and they wait for the results. It's across the street from Western Union. So Lincoln's running back and forth as so say. And, um, First Pennsylvania comes in with the uh, news that they were going for Lincoln and then New York does. And uh, Lincoln realizes he is in fact the president and they all end up going to an ice cream parlor for an after party. So um, I really think that this is a turning point for Lincoln particularly. I don't think anybody can understand Abraham Lincoln until you understand his relationships with Hay and Nicolay and Ellsworth. They haven't been studied enough. This last night, and then the couple of weeks before he leaves Springfield, he really leaves his old life behind and goes on to become the Abraham Lincoln we know and, and 
hopefully love. Um, and during the time that is between winning the election and leaving Springfield, uh, Elmer Ellsworth is busy. Not only is he studying law, he's passing the bar exam, and he presented a plan to the Illinois legislature for the reorganization of the state militia. He turned his militia company, the Illinois Zoo of Cadets, over to the uh, governor of Chicago at the time, and uh, felt that if all the states in the United States, um, at least the northern part of the United States, would just follow some of these plans, they would be much, much uh, more ready for a war if in fact a war came. Puts the state on a firmer wartime footing. And uh, before it, it's at every point where it's voted on, it is uh, passed except for the final vote. And he's not there for the final vote. In fact, the final vote never gets taken because by that time there's a war on. He's already left with the Lincoln family to go to Washington. Um, this is a reproduction of the inaugural Express in 1861. One of the most interesting parts of my research was the um, plot to kill Lincoln on the 1861 presidential, you know, the presidential Express. And uh, I sure hope Somebody makes a great movie of it someday. The characters are interesting. The plot is compelling. I just think um, it would be a fascinating uh, uh, part of history to look at. For a long time, they weren't sure if uh, the plot was really um, real, but the Freedom of Information Act finally released uh, Pinkerton's notes. And uh, in fact, uh, it was real. There was a plot to kill Lincoln. And uh, I think it'd make a wonderful movie. Another reason it's there is that um, uh, these engines, for any of you have any interest in trains at all, these engines are just amazing. And each, um, the engines were changed at every city and town because of changes in the track. And each town, each city tried to outdo each other. And these were marvels of the, of the day. They were just spit polished and shined and chromed and gilded and, uh, decorated inside and out. They must have been must have been wonderful to see. And uh, this is a drawing, of course, with the Lincoln's leaving Springfield on the inaugural express. Uh, Lincoln's words to the people that he left behind in Springfield are pretty well known. Anyway, the little guy standing behind Lincoln, I think, is supposed to be um, is supposed to be Elmer Elmer Ellsworth. Um, he asks to accompany Lincoln to Washington. He was put in charge of the presidential party um, all the time that the party was not on the train. So within hours of the time Lincoln left Springfield, the folks in Washington were aware of what's now called the Baltimore plot. And uh, the last, um, when Lincoln decided to leave the train finally and travel to Washington with Pinkerton detective Kate Warren and Ward Hill Lehman, Ellsworth was tasked with guarding personally tasked by Mr. Lincoln to guard Mrs. Lincoln and the boys as they continued along the original route through Baltimore and onto the Capitol. Um, like I say, this is the uh, a grand plot, wonderful characters, beautiful steam trains. I don't know what else to say. Somebody should do this. Um, one of the things that happened to uh, poor Elmer and poor Mr. Lincoln is that um, Lincoln had promised Ellsworth a job as a major of militias when they got to Washington. And both Lincoln and Elmer were ignorant of how exactly the army appointed men to be officers. Major General Winfield Scott, aware of the assassination attempt, uh, and he was determined to get Abraham Lincoln safely inaugurated. And he had already appointed Colonel Charles Stone the uh, other man, you might know him from Ball's Bluff, um, in charge of coordinating the local militias in the U.S. Army to make the capital safe until Lincoln was inaugurated. Every time they do something in our capital nowadays to uh, keep the president safe, I think back to this time period. Um, it was the first time in 1861 that they had had to worry about whether the president was safe or not. Um, both Scott and Stone did an excellent job 
by the way, and Ellsworth graciously backed out of his promise as soon as he understood the situation. He didn't want to cause any issues at all for Abraham Lincoln, no matter what he had been promised. So uh, this is uh, Tad Lincoln in his Zouave uniform. Uh, he and Willie loved Ellsworth like an older brother. Ellsworth came to play with them quite often at the, at the White House. And this is Willard's Hotel in Washington. And the reason that both of these slides are here is that uh, Elmer Ellsworth lived in the Willard after he came to Washington. And here's the problem. One evening, Elmer Ellsworth felt ill, kind of feverish. He went to bed and woke up with spots all over his face. And his, his younger brother had died within the last year of what might have been smallpox. It's probably typhoid. And Elmer panicked. He thought he had smallpox. Oh, my God. He was scared beyond belief. And he, uh, I hate to admit this, he acted like the diva he sometimes was. He went to what he was sure was his deathbed and did not get up. Several days later, Hay and Nicolay come pounding on the door at Willard's. You know, Elmer, get up. You can't stay in. We know, are you all right? Are you alive in there? And they were very concerned about him. And Ellsworth peeks around the door thinking at least he would be able to say his final goodbyes um, to his friends. And Hay informs him that, that the Lincoln boys had come down a few days earlier with the measles and that he had caught measles from the boys and it was not smallpox. Nevertheless, he was, uh, Elmer Ellsworth was very ill. As you know, for an adult, measles is a serious illness. And um, one afternoon, when Hay was visiting uh, Ellsworth at uh, Willard's, probably mopping his brow, uh, the, they spoke of the current political situation and Hay told Ellsworth it was dire. And then he recorded Ellsworth's reaction. I can only speak for myself. You know, I have a great work to do to which my life is pledged, yet I could ask no better death than to fall next week before Sumter. You will find that patriotism is not dead even if it sleeps. So Sumter falls and Abraham Lincoln calls for 75,000 men and Ellsworth drags himself from his bed to go see Lincoln. Ellsworth explains that he wants to go to New York City and recruit a regiment from the ranks of the New York City firefighters. Um, the reason he wants to do this is that firefighters by the nature of their training can fight both alone individually and as a team. They're able to look around, find where they're needed uh, to be and get there as quickly as possible. Lincoln writes him a letter of introduction to Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune. And Ellsworth says, I want the New York firemen. There are no more effective men in the country and none with whom I can do so much. They're sleeping on a volcano at Washington and I want men who can go into a fight now. Well, Elmer Ellsworth was amazingly successful. Over 1,200 firemen were recruited in less than uh, than 12 days. Excuse me, less than two days. It was uh, he was so successful that the mayor of New York was concerned that the number of uh, volunteers was going to decimate the New York Fire Department, and he limited Ellsworth to one regiment. Uh, one of the other things Ellsworth did, Ellsworth was always very popular with his men and uh, didn't have, even though he was not a professional soldier, never had any trouble having his orders obeyed or being respected. One of the things that he knew to do was to use the men who already commanded in the New York Fire Department and just move them into um, uh, the, what became the 11th New York Fire Zouaves. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel Noah Farnham, Major Krieger, um, were taken from the fire department and put into uh, 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 positions of command. Lieutenant Colonel actually takes over for Ellsworth after his death, and uh, Farnham refuses to take the um, title of Colonel because he says he could never replace Ellsworth. Um, luminaries from politics, business, and the stage gathered to present flags to Ellsworth's fire zouaves. As they were being called, these are uh, pictures of the flag. The first one is the uh, original flag of the 11th New York. And the other one is the 2011 sesquicentennial flag. And uh, uh, these are uh, two or three of the men who 
uh, portrayed that unit in 2011 and the flag that they made was a almost perfect reproduction and is hand sewn. And to see it is just like, I mean, it just takes you back in history. And uh, um, on the 11th, they uh, sail, no, on, pardon me. Uh, they sail from New York on the Baltic, which is the same little boat that, a uh, well, big boat, that um, uh, tried to resupply Sumter. And they, they leave New York Harbor on their way to the capital. And the, his unit is now designated officially the 11th New York Volunteer Infantry. And uh, they march down um, through New York, down to the wharf and took the Baltic to Annapolis. Uh, when they arrived at the Capitol, they were placed in the Senate chambers. No camps had been set up. This is not true just for him, but for all of the men who came to New York. Um, but the fire zouaves were a little different. Uh, you know, they're young men. They're sort of away from the big city for the first time. And, uh, you know, I, they're crazy Irishmen. <laughs> so they climbed to the top of the rotunda. They held mock sessions of Congress. They drank too much and caroused and generally made a nuisance of themselves in the city. Um, of course, all the units arriving in Washington did pretty much the same thing. Elmer Ellsworth was mortified and he paid their fines. He only sent two men back to New York and generally tried to quiet the rumors and quell the bad publicity. Then luckily a fire broke out. Um, it was next to Willard's Hotel and the Washington Fire Department thought they put it out, but two hours later, it um, uh, sprang back up again and terrified everybody. And somebody said, well, call the fire zoops. So they did. And uh, Elmer Ellsworth went to the, um, police, uh, the fire chief in Washington and said, give me that fire horn and uh, I'll run this operation. And... Um, he did and did it successfully. If you get a chance to go back on your own and really look at this picture, you'll see the kinds of things that he found so enticing about uh, the firemen. There are men hung from their ankles upside down to uh, get water on the fire. There's a human ladder forming to get firemen to the top of the building. Uh, the same thing's true to get the firemen from the ground to the second floor. And uh, this is the kind of thing that was just perfect for uh, not only a New York firefighter, but um, the Zouave drill. So um, Elmer Ellsworth and his men saved the day. By this time, uh, the camps outside Washington were all ready and all the problems were solved. Uh, he got his firemen out of the city and uh, both the 11th and their colonel were back in everybody's good graces again. And um, Elmer Ellsworth was, as it says, a singularly attractive man. And he got kitted a lot for um, uh, being a non-professional union officer. And he took this pretty seriously. So um, he was always trying to make sure that his, his men were um, uh, just perfectly behaved and perfectly uniformed and, and everything. So we get to May 23rd, 24th. The uh, reason we know it's that date is and knew it much earlier is because although Virginia had uh, voted for secession, it had to be ratified by the population of Virginia. Alexandria is right across the Potomac from Washington, from Lincoln's office with a telescope. He could see the flag that we're going to be talking about in a moment. And Lincoln decided that he was going to put Alexandria under military law. It was, you know, under, under martial law and um, it got in touch with the people at Alexandria and said, no, it's not going to work. You guys are too close. This is what's going to happen. Um, you know, no harm, no foul, but they're going under uh, military control here. So um, he had been, uh, he had told out Alexandria that they would be coming uh, the night that the um, secession was, was ratified. And that's, uh, that's what happened. Uh, the US Army moved into the town. There was a full moon. 
Cavalry and artillery used the bridges to cross the Potomac. The Zouaves crossed on paddle wheel steamers. And Elmer had requested that his men, the 11th New York, was to be in the vanguard of this movement, the first to disembark. And this brings us to another point of view. This is uh, James Jackson. He's the proprietor of the Marshall House Hotel in Alexandria, Virginia. The Marshall House Hotel is a family hotel and boarding house in Alexandria. Uh, the book has a whole chapter on Jackson and uh, he had kind of a wild reputation, but he was a young Southern Hotspur, uh, uh, rabidly in favor of secession, um, kind of kind of a warmonger, but um, you know nothing that a lot of young Southern men were not. This is the Marshall House Hotel, and you can see the flag on top of it. It's at the corner of uh, Pitt and King Street, and you can sort of see from that. Um, picture how big the flag is. So here's a drawing of the flag and on the left and on the right is what is left of the actual Marshall House flag. It was 18 by 24 feet and it is made of sailcloth. It's currently in the New York State Military Museum. And there are sort of historiography historiographical myths about the flag. One is that Mrs. Lincoln folded it up and put it in a bureau drawer um, and that Tad removed it from the drawer and dragged it around to the cabinet meetings. But the truth is it's huge. It's made out of sailcloth and there are too many uh, instances of the flag being souvenired as they say. Um, uh, so bits of it were sold to people to make money. It did not languish in a, a drawer in the, the presidential mansion at all. Um, and these are conservators putting together what's what's left of the flag. The uh, stars were uh, was taken down each time a state seceded, a star was sewn on. And then when Virginia seceded, the big star was sewn in the middle. And uh, James Jackson uh, paid for that. So it was his personal flag. So uh, Elmer Ellsworth leaves the wharf to march down um, uh, to downtown Alexandria. He has soldiers and journalists with him and they're supposed to cut the Union wires, Western Union wires, so there's no communication between the Confederate Army and Alexandria. And as they're walking down the street, he sees the flag, there are some excellent maps in the, the book that were made to show how this tiny, almost infinitesimal action took place. But you can see how you know, just right from the wharf to a, a pit and you know a right turn and bam, there they are. And uh, Elmer looks up at the flag and says, that flag must come down. And he decides to send all but seven men to the telegraph office. And uh, with the remaining men, he enters the marshal Marshall House Hotel. Now, uh, the remaining men are not all soldiers. Um, a lot of, well, several of them are reporters as well. And this, this particular painting uh, is The Death of Ellsworth. It's by Alonzo Chaplin, who's a well-known military painter in the 1880s. And uh, any of you know anything at all about how to read a Victorian painting, uh, you can see the guns cross, and by making a, a cross, that means that this is uh, an uh, important socially, you know, spiritually, uh, this, this painting is. Um, the uh, bright uh, tin cup that hangs from Brownell's bag, uh, backpack in the back, is uh, indicative of a soul. Um, and you can see how Elmer Ellsworth was trying to drag the um, flag down the stairs. The light's carefully controlled in the painting. I had the pleasure of seeing it uh, in 2011 at the National Portrait Gallery. And um, it says the light's carefully controlled. It guides your eyes into and through the painting and really lets the story emerge. If you ever have a chance to see this, this is one of the paintings that I think is most accessible of all the Civil War paintings. And I've seen a bunch of them. Well, what happens is um, they come down the stairs, they meet Jackson and um, 
Jackson and Ellsworth die. The first thing they do is go up the stairs. They meet a man at the very beginning of the, the stairs on the first floor. He goes, I don't know, you know, uh, I just woke up. Uh, I don't know anything about this. So um, Ellsworth leaves uh, Zuav at, on the landing on the first floor, goes up to the second floor, leaves a, a soldier there, goes up to the third floor, up the trap door, onto the roof, cuts the halyards, takes the flag down, and is coming back down the steps when a man in uh, his pajama top and pants meets him on the second floor of the landing. He has a double-barreled shotgun. He fires one shot, hits Ellsworth in the breast, and um, Frank Brownell, Private Frank Brownell, is right in front of Ellsworth. He has uh, a gun that has um, a bayonet. His bayonet pushes the uh, Jackson's gun aside, so the second shot goes awry and uh, then turns and shoots Jackson and bayonets Jackson to make sure that, that it's a killing shot. This all takes place within seconds. I mean, maybe three seconds. It's just so quickly that nobody realizes what's happened until I, I picture it as being from all this commotion to silence. And there are two dead men lying at the bottom of the stairs. Well, the world is stunned. Uh, it's all kept quiet at first in Alexandria. The body is taken to the Naval Yard. Um, from Alexandria, the, uh, the 11th New York is put on a, a boat and taken to the middle of the Potomac so that they won't see what's going on and uh, tear up Alexandria in retaliation. Um, Mrs. Lincoln uh, comes to the Naval Yard bringing flowers and uh, is joined a little a few minutes later by her husband and the Lincolns are devastated. This is, he's like a son to them. And they're both in, in tears. Headlines on every uh, newspaper, North and South. Of course, the Southern newspapers are going to present Elmer as breaking and entering. But um, if you know anything about uh, being under military control, they've been told he was there. You know, and you have to obey the military um, if you're under, under military control. So uh, the Lincolns decide that he is going to lie in state in the East Room of the Executive Mansion. Uh, this is a, a picture of, of Private Brownell, the man who killed the man who killed Ellsworth. And they are linked together forever, of course. This is a hard to see drawing, um, but Civil War artist Alfred Wode uh, was at Ellsworth's funeral in East Room, East Room of the Executive Mansion. Uh, Zouaves accompanied the casket and they bring the flag with them. So it's obviously not in a drawer in Mrs. Lincoln's uh, cupboard. Um, then after the ceremonies are over, the casket and the remains are taken to Union Station. They go by train to New York City where um, it's met by Ellsworth's parents. He lies in state at both the Astor House and City Hall, and then taken by boat up the Hudson. Um, the, the, whole new, the whole Northeast is just uh, uh, taken aback by what's happened. They didn't expect um, uh, casualties, and they certainly didn't expect one this early. Although if you notice the um, upper left, I did include a Southern envelope, the housebreaker and thief, uh, but it, Ellsworth's image was all over stationary. Um, funeral dirges were written and uh, it, more music was written in Chicago for Elmer Ellsworth than for any other individual in the war, including Lincoln. Wreaths and cockades uh, were made to uh, uh, acknowledge the, the death of the martyr Ellsworth. And um, his coat, uh, his dress uniform jacket is at the New York Military Museum. And you can see the hole uh, near his heart where he was uh, shot. Used to be a lot more gruesome, um, but in the, I think the early 1950s, uh, some well-meaning museum curator decided it needed to go to the cleaners because it was nasty and bloody and needed to get cleaned. So 
you know, um, anyway, this is what we have left. Um, and this, of course, is Ellsworth's iconic red kepi. This is at the Ward, uh, Fort Ward Museum uh, in Alexandria. And this was the, the one thing that I saw that almost immediately my eyes welled up in tears. I had seen that pictures of that kepi so many times, photographs of it so many times that to see it in person was very, very moving for me. Um, John Hay, of course, wrote an incredibly beautiful uh, obituary for him. It's also in the book. And um, so here's a quote from it to his friends. He always seemed like a paladin or cavalier of the dead days of romance and beauty. It's buried in the Hudson Cemetery. This is a fall day. And uh, in a letter that he had, uh, El Ellsworth had written to his parents, he said, he who noteth even the fall of a sparrow will have some purpose even in the fate of one like me. Um, if you read his correspondence immediately prior to his death, you have the idea that he perhaps realized he was going to die. These, uh, it's the same grave, of course, and this uh, wreaths are surrounding the uh, Ellsworth family plot, uh, and they're there for the sesquicentennial where they reenacted the, the funeral. And then, of course, a few drops of blood from Jackson and Ellsworth, and within a very few weeks, those few <laughs> drops of blood had... Uh, or just the beginning of a torrent of blood that was not um, not to let up for four sad, horrible, bloody years. So Elmer Ellsworth was the first to fall. <laughs>